I see we are recording. And here come our attendees. So once we actually get to seven o'clock, we'll, we shall start. Do I need to press something? No, you're fine. Do you see the attendees? People coming in, we're up to 13. Yeah, but now. I see a box that says this meeting is being recorded. It's a big white box and I can't see you anymore or, or me. Should I click continue? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I didn't want it to blow up or something. That's fine. <laughs> Welcome as folks are joining us here. We're, uh, we're just going to wait till seven o'clock, um, which means we have about two more minutes. But thank you for taking some time this evening to join us for the program. We're working out our technical difficulties. Uh, this evening's program will also be uh, live streamed on the, the library's Facebook page. So if you have friends who couldn't sign up in time, just quickly send them a text and tell them to go to uh, the Attleboro Public Library's Facebook page and they can watch along with us. Uh, and it'll also be uh, picked up and broadcast by our local cable channel, uh, AACS. So we will give it another minute and then we will get started. Um, you should all have access to the Q&A box. So throughout the presentation, if you have questions, feel free to put them in there or you can put items in chat as needed and my role tonight after I introduce our speaker will be to monitor those two areas. So please do feel free to communicate. If you don't see me paying attention or if I'm missing you, uh, use the little raise hand signal to, to clue me in that there's something something there. Okay. Give it one more minute and we will go live. Okay, it is now seven o'clock, so we shall begin. So officially, uh, good evening and thank you for joining us. Uh, folks from the Attleboro Public Library probably know me, but we did a lot of marketing, so I'm hoping we've reached out to some other folks as well. I'm Chris Johnson, the director at the Attleboro Public Library. Uh, the other lovely face on the screen is our speaker this evening. That's Ellen Everett Hopman. Ellen is an author of both fiction and nonfiction, an herbalist, a lay homeopath, a lecturer and a mental health counselor who lives and works in Western Massachusetts. She is the author of several books and audio tapes on paganism and Druidry and three novels. You may visit Ellen's website. It's at ellenevertthopman.com and I will put that into the, the chat once we get started uh, to learn more about Ellen, to follow her blogs and to purchase her books. Tonight's presentation, A History of Witch Persecution, is based on Ellen's book, The Real Witches of New England. You may purchase a copy from Ellen's website, or you can request one, thank you, thank you for the nice modeling there, Vanna, or request one from the library, as we have just added three copies to our collection. Uh, as mentioned, please use the Q&A box to enter any questions that you may have during and at the end of the presentation. Um, we are planning for about 90 minutes this evening, so hopefully you can join us for the full thing, but we are recording. So if you do have to leave early, feel free to then visit the uh, Big Read website for the link, and I will give that information as well shortly. Uh, tonight's presentation is just one of over 25 programs and book discussions based on the themes of this year's NEA Big Read. I managed to bring home my banner and hang it up. <laughs> uh, Attleboro title this year, we're reading uh, Circe. Let's see if I can hold that the right direction for the camera. Circe, there we are. Uh, by Madeline Miller. Uh, the NEA Big Read is a program of the National Endowment of the Arts in partnership with Arts Midwest. Uh, all of the programs that we're offering this year are listed in our event calendar, uh, and they are all based on various themes that are in the book, including this evening's presentation. Uh, the NEA Big Read Attleboro is organized by a coalition of community partners that comprises our One Adventure, One Book, com One Community, also known as the One ABC Committee. Tomorrow evening, the Literacy Center is hosting a Life of Journeys, also on Zoom, 
On Tuesday, Bristol Community College is presenting Professor Michael Geary's lecture on Odysseus, revered, reviled, and still relevant. And on Thursday, just a week from um, tomorrow, October 8th, and in Luckley Story, the bookstore, is hosting our keynote presentation with the author, Madeline Miller, in conversation with Dr. Kevin, Kevin Kalish from Bridgewater State University. Uh, learn more about all of these upcoming free programs by visiting our NEA Big Read Attleboro website. It's attleboros1abc.org. Again, I will put that in the chat for you. Uh, this Saturday, beginning at 9 a.m., we will be distributing free copies of Circe while they last, I might add, because it's a hot number, at the Attleboro Farmer's Market at O'Connell Field in Caitlin Park. So stop by to pick up a copy along with a calendar, which I showed you of all of our upcoming events. Uh, we were able to, thanks to the generous grant funding from not only the National Endowment for the Arts, also from Bristol County Savings Bank Foundation, the Friends of the Attleboro Public Library, the Attleboro Cultural uh, Council in partnership with the Massachusetts Cultural Council and the Rotary uh, put together quite a calendar of programs even in this time of COVID. So I do appreciate your participation uh, and I thank you for your attention and please join me in a virtual round of welcoming applause for our speaker, Ellen Everett Hopman. I will be the official. And Ellen has asked me to stay on screen. Normally I would minimize myself at this point. So I'll just sit here. Smile. Well, hello, everybody. Um, I wish I could see your faces. It'd be very nice. Uh, but I, I know you, some of you are there. And um, this uh, doing things virtually like this has turned out to be one of the unexpected perks of the COVID pandemic. Uh, I didn't expect to have any positive things come out of it. But um, I've been able to do talks like this in Ireland, um, England, all over the US without having to leave my office. Here I am. <laughs> and um, I live in Belchertown. I live in an oak forest. Um, I am a practicing druid. And I'm a full time writer now. That's what I do. Um, and uh, I'm not a trained witch, although I've been hanging out with witches for over 30 years now. A lot of my best friends are witches, and I've certainly um, been to a lot of festivals, uh, many festivals over the last 30 years, uh, going to rituals and ceremonies and um, doing workshops and classes and hanging out with witches. Um, I did not expect to write a book about witches. That wasn't on my agenda. Um, but then I went to a place called the Deja Brew Coffee House in Wendell. If anybody knows that place, I don't think it, I don't think it's there anymore or it's been renamed. Um, anyway, I went there one day and uh, I heard a poet, um, Michael Mowry, read a poem and it was about Mary Webster, who is the Witch of Hadley. And I, I mean, I live in Western Mass. And for some reason, I mean, I'd always heard about Salem. You know, everybody knows about Salem. And so I'm not going to dwell on Salem that much because I recommend people go to Salem. You can hear talks there and, uh, you know, take tours and get yourself um, familiar with what happened there. I'll talk about it a little bit. But he started talking about Mary Webster and it just happened that I was working in Hadley at the time. And um, she's buried at Old Hadley Cemetery, um, which I used to drive by on my way to Northampton. If you go from Hadley to Northampton, you drive right by that cemetery, which I, I had no idea what it was. And um, then, you know, she was five minutes from where I worked, 17 minutes from my house. And then I, I thought, wow, I've lived in the valley here for over 30 years. And how come nobody talks about Mary Webster, you know? So I'm going to read a little bit of the poem that got, that, that created the book, the poem that caused it all to happen. Um, just the beginning. He said, Mary Webster, you're poor, not rich. And so you stand barefoot, accused. Someone must be blamed. You're a witch. You are a witch in times like these, because before your door, you make hay carts tip and tumble 
of honest men on goodly errand, on the long slog of mud road that never drains, through your dooryard in the darkened bend, because you make their horses balk, and oxen cease to draw, and ox carts shake, and drovers' cattle spook, you make milk curdle, and chimneys smoke, and soap kettles boil over, and generally in wood or mowing, barnyard, hearthside, or highway, you, our Lord's good work, suspend, upend, till good wives vexed curse, and yeomen bedeviled hop in unholy rage from stone to stone with unchristian thought, with rod or switch to beat or whip the fear of him from whom all good things come back into you and break your unkind mischief. I, Mary Webster, in this meeting house, you have not been seen this 12 month on many a Sabbath day to hear his wonder working word. You have borne no witness done no Christian deed, and now of witchcraft you are under strong suspicion. And uh, it's actually, it's a whole chapbook. It's one poem that's an entire book. So that's just the beginning. But Mary Webster, um, well, she had the misfortune of being poor. And, um, you know, as I was researching, I, I figured out some of what was going on, but in the colonies, if, if your husband died, say you were a widow uh, or you happened to be poor for some reason, the community was responsible. So the church would, would gather, I guess, you know, food, clothing, money, whatever, and they would distribute it to the poor. Now, if you're a good Christian, isn't that what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to take care of the poor and the sick and all that. Well, people resented it. They didn't like it. And um, so if you were poor, you were automatically not liked. So what they said about her was that if anybody tried to go by her door, um, the horse would not, it would stop and then not go any further unless they went into the house and beat her up. And this is what they did. They would go into the house, beat her, and then the horse would continue or the ox cart or whatever. So um, they decided she must be a witch because the animals, you know, weren't cooperating. Um, and what eventually what happened was uh, they decided to hang her. And she's called Half-Hanged Mary. That's her name. Uh, they took her out in the snow and they hung her from a tree and they left her there for 12 hours. They came back and she was still alive. <laughs> They cut her down and she was alive. And so they threw her in a snowbank and left her there. Now, the only thing I can figure is the snow must have been deep and maybe her toes were touching the snow. I don't know. But because she survived being hung, they didn't try again. They left her alone. Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, what I'm going to do now, that's the Witch of Hadley. Um, I'm going to go into the background of, of, you know, what happened here in New England was kind of the last cry or the dernier cri, you know, the end of the witch persecution. Uh, after Salem, everybody was so ashamed, they just put a stop to it, really. And I do think that's maybe why Massachusetts is kind of liberal to this day, because I think people were so horrified at what they had just done. But um, there's a long history. And again, I've, you know, when I was studying the history, I, it's, I, I got back as far as 1400 BC. That's as far back as I could get because that was the earliest written account. Um, but the more I, th I thought about it, um, I realized that, uh, and I hope I don't, you know, usually somebody gets mad at me. <laughs> so if you get mad, you can put a question in the Q&A. <laughs> but um, it took about a thousand years to convert the Europeans to Christianity. So during that thousand year period, a lot of stuff happened. It wasn't all peaceful. Um, and again, I'm not going to get into all of that, but uh, especially in areas like France, it was really bad. Um, and during those thousand years, um, gradually people were converted and um, 
it wasn't pretty. So I think this whole witch persecution, part of it is the, the sociology of the old woman, the poor woman, the old person, the gay person, the Jew, they were all being persecuted um, because they were different. But I think it was also the kind of the birth pangs of Christianity. And so the way I look at it, and you can get mad at me if you want, <laughs> but Christianity is a Middle Eastern religion, comes from the Middle East, has the mores of the Middle East, the position of women, um, you know, up until very recently, when you went into church, your head had to be covered, you know, and of course, all during the Middle Ages and, and after that, even in Puritan times, you know, women had to cover up. That was a Middle Eastern idea. You still see that in, you know, Arab countries and Egypt, and that's where all this came from. So before that, um, Europeans were a forest dwelling, primarily, culture. Um, women, so there were some very powerful women, but women, maybe they didn't have exactly the same, same rights as men everywhere. They did in some places, especially Scandinavia. Um, but, uh, you know, the women had rights of divorce, which they didn't get, well, we didn't get back until within the last century, right? Uh, they had rights of inheritance. Um, and we lost all of that. That was lost when the missionaries came in. And we're still, we're still trying to, to get it back. So, so I think that this whole witch thing is just a big illustration of the struggle that was going on between um, one, the old religion and then the new one that came in. So if anybody has uh, problems with that, feel free to ask a question. All right, so um, I'm gonna go into the timeline and, and then I'm gonna go into modern witchcraft um, because I have uh, quite a bit of notes here about what it is to be a witch. I understand you've been reading a book about that. Um, I haven't read the book that you read, but so, um, first of all, you hear the term nine million witches were burned. That's not really true. Um, anywhere from 40,000 to 300,000 is the estimate of how many people, so-called witches, and they were, most of them were Christian, by the way. They were accused as witches. Um, but that's how many were killed in Europe, anyway. But, um, so what were they, what were they using? Uh, there's a line in Exodus, and the way it was translated, it says, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Exodus 22:18. Uh, Leviticus 20:27. 20, a man also, or a woman, that hath a familiar spirit, or that is a wizard, shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones, their blood shall be upon them. So that's right in the Old Testament. So the word witch in the Old Testament, um, there's a lot of disagreement on uh, what that word really is. The Hebrew is kashaf. I hope I'm saying it right. Anyway, that means to whisper. So somebody who whispers a spell, um, that's one meaning. Another meaning is evil sorceress or a woman who uses spoken spells to harm others. And then there's a third translation, which is poisoner. So to me, it makes more sense when you say, thou shalt not suffer a poisoner to live. Um, but uh, the, and as we get into the history, you know, when the King James Bible came along and so on, there was terror of witches. So I think that's why they turned it into the word witch, but we don't know for sure. So um, what was happening around uh, the time the Old Testament was being written? Previous to that, you had the Canaanite religion, which was um, polytheistic, and it had goddesses and gods. The goddesses, uh, the main goddesses were Asherah and Astarte. Uh, the main gods were Baal and El, um, and they, it was an earth religion. It had earth festivals. Um, so along comes the high temple Hebrew patriarchal religion. So 
having a patriarchal religion where the deity is male and the priests are male is very different from having a polytheistic earth-centered religion that honors, there's, honors goddesses. Um, so the patriarchal high temple male religion had to um, suppress or get rid of the Canaanite goddess worshiping religion. So that was, um, and they were the ones that wrote the, the Old Testament. That's the high temple, patriarchal, Hebrew, high priest, uh, high temple people. Okay, so um, you can see that in the writings. And the book of Jeremiah, for example, it says, the children gather wood and the fathers kindle the fire and the women knead the dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods that they may provoke me to anger. And that's Yahweh speaking. Yahweh, by the way, was a minor deity before they got a hold of him. He was a cup bearer to the gods. Now he becomes the main deity. Um, but Jeremiah is saying that these children and, and women and, and fathers are making offerings to the queen of heaven, which is probably Asherah or Astarte, and doing that deliberately just to make him mad. Okay, another quote, um, and said the women, when we were burning sacrifices to the queen of heaven and were pouring out libations to her, was it without our husbands that we made for her sacrificial cakes in her image and poured out libations to her? So we know what they were doing. They were making drink offerings and they were making little cakes for her and putting them in the fire and so on. Why? Because when you put stuff in the fire, it goes up and that's how you send offerings to heaven. You put it in the fire. You know, There's nothing, um, there's no evil intent there. It's just you send things to heaven that way. Um, okay, so then the monotheist Hebrew patriarchal high temple religion morphs into Christianity. And of course, that was a big struggle, um, which you guys are all familiar with. So um, fast forward to the fourth century uh, CE. St. Augustine of Hippo expresses his opinion that only the monotheist God can control the powers of nature. So therefore, it's impossible for a witch to have any power. And since witches were powerless, the church had no reason to persecute them. So that was the initial reaction. It's like, what's a witch? A witch is nothing. It's just an old woman who mutters things, and, or an old man, or a person. And um, only God can work miracles, and only God has power, so there's nothing to worry about. Um, okay, so then comes 600 years later. Do you guys remember Y2K? All right, they had the same thing in the year 1000. Oh, I see there's four questions in the chat. Uh, before I launch into that, uh, what, what are the questions that we have? Do you see them? Um, the, in the chat was my notes to the panelists and inviting them to send questions. <laughs> oh, okay. I see four questions four comments, but okay. Um, so around the year 1000, they had their Y1K panic, just like we did. You remember we thought all the computers were going to fail and people started hoarding food. And um, so in the year 1000, when the calendar was about to turn, um, they decided that that meant the world was going to end. And um, they thought the devil was going to make a personal appearance because that was the most frightening thing they could think of. And um, that was when they began talking about Satan. Before that, um, Satan wasn't a big character, but all, at this time, um, demons and Satan start to get amped up. And uh, people begin talking about, fantasizing about having sex with incubi and succubi, male and female demons. Um, and then um, by the year 1200, which is 200 years later, the devil or Satan starts to appear in Christian art for the first time. Uh, you start getting clergy who are specialists in demonology for the first time. Um, 
Okay, then in the year 1208, the church under Pope Innocent III uh, starts persecuting Cathars as heretics. And the Cathars are very interesting. They were proto-feminists. They allowed women to have sacerdotal functions to, you know, run rituals and so on. And that was absolutely unacceptable. The, again, the Christian clergy was now modeled on the high temple male Jewish monotheistic model, and they couldn't have that. Uh, so they decided that the Cathars were a threat and they massacred the Cathars. Um, so, so this is all, what you're seeing here is power power struggles and the church trying to consolidate its power. Uh, in the year 1273, Thomas Aquinas said, the world is full of evil demons, and those demons are determined to lead men into temptation with women in order to spread their seed. And this is the first time that sex and witchcraft are conflated. Um, you know, sexy witches are all over the place now, but before that, there was nothing sexy about a witch. In the 1300s, witches are now being depicted as devil worshipers who had made a pact with Satan in order to get supernatural powers. However, witches are male. They're all male. They're not female at this point. Um, theologians are preoccupied with the idea that witches are in league with the devil. They are, uh, the devil is the number one adversary of the church. This is what the church is worried about. Meanwhile, the peasants, the people that are growing the crops and, you know, having chickens and cows and all that, that's not what they're thinking about. The common people are thinking about who's, what's harming my, my flocks, what's harming my fields. Um, so if there are these, um, you know, if the Satan is running around uh, and demons are running around, maybe that's why my crops failed. Um, so the Knights Templar, who are a powerful military and financial order, um, they, King Philip IV of France was in debt to them. So his solution was to torture and burn them and, and kill them. Um, so now both the Cathars and the Knights Templar are being persecuted and they're accused of Satanism, sorcery, sodomy, all kinds of things. Um, and then other... The Jews are also being persecuted at, at this time because you can't have any competition. Waldensians, who are Christians who believe in poverty, they believe in apostolic poverty because that's what Jesus talked about, right? Can't have that. Um, so they're persecuted. Um, lepers and homosexuals are persecuted, and they're all accused of trying to undermine and destroy Christianity. So this is Christianity is still trying to establish its power base, um, still not feeling confident. Uh, in the year 1326, uh, Pope John the 12th, or sorry, the 22nd, officially launches the Inquisition. And he, this, he authorizes the prosecution of witchcraft as heresy. Now it becomes actual heresy. Uh, in 1348 to 1350, the Black Death happens, the plague. And, um, you know, the church, you know, had been telling people, you know, just pray, everything's going to be fine. But of course it wasn't. So they said, uh, this must be caused by our enemies. And um, so, again, uh, worshipers of Satan, witches, heretics, Jews, were all blamed for the plague um, because supposedly they're demonic and they practice witchcraft. Um, the, the burning of Jews and heretics really gets going. 50 million people die, 60% of Europe, kind of a big thing. People are getting more and more terrified, more and more paranoid uh, during this time. So the, in 1376, a manual is published in France, a manual for inquisitors that tells you directly how to conduct investigations, how to conduct a proper trial. 
the definitions of different kinds of heretics and so on. It's all becoming standardized. Um, and then the Western Alps in 1428, they had their first uh, series of, of trials, witch trials. I'm, I'm really, I'm going through this quickly, but uh, 1431 to 37, the Council of Basel uh, is held an anti-witch church council that standardizes the satanic witch stereotype. Um, they now have a stereotype of what a witch is. The people that attended that council then spread out all through Europe and took their standardized idea. Um, and then um, the printing press comes along in 1440. And once you have a printing press, which that was the equivalent of the internet back then, um, now all this stuff is very standardized. It's in books. You, you take the book, you go country to country, and everybody has um, trials, and uh, everybody's standardizing what a witch is and so on. Um, witches are still primarily male wizards at this point, okay, because women, first of all, men, the only people that were educated, I guess except for maybe rare exceptions of nuns, um, usually educated people were male. Women were not allowed to be educated. So the thought was that to be a witch, to be a powerful, demonic, satanic, you know, worker, whatever they were, um, you had to be male because it, you had to have some education and women had no education. So they're still at this point thinking of witches as male wizards. Um, in uh, 1458, uh, Nicholas Jacquier, uh, uh, who attended the Council of Basel, writes a book, and he describes witchcraft, witchcraft as an abominable sect and heresy of wizards. And um, the book goes on to justify why they should be persecuted. Um, okay, so the Cathars, who I mentioned before, in the mid-1400s now, the Cathars are being tortured, and under torture, they confess to flying to meetings with Satan, kissing Satan's rear end, casting spells, raising storms, and having sex with animals. And this is all under torture, and this is um, accepted as truth. If you said it under torture, it must be true, right? Um, so in 1475, this is when the, the worm turns. Johannes Nieder publishes a book called Formicarius, where the first time he starts saying uneducated females can be witches. And his reasoning was that females are, were inferior physically, mentally, and morally, and therefore more susceptible to the devil. So now in 1475, the witch persona starts turning into a, a woman for the first time. Um, so in 1484, Pope Innocent VIII accuses German Satanists, what he calls Satanists, of consorting with demons, ruining crops, and aborting babies. So if you lost your baby, uh, if you had a miscarriage, it was a Satanist that did it. If your crops failed, if the weather was bad, it was a Satanist that did it. Um, he issued a papal bull that affirmed the existence of witches and approved the Inquisition. It's called the Witch Bull of 1484. Um, he charges the Inquisition to do everything necessary to eradicate witches. Um, he says they cause abortions, make men impotent, make women barren. And uh, a very famous book uh, is also commissioned by Pope Innocent VIII, uh, he, commission, he commissions Heinrich Kramer and Jacob Sprenger to pen a report called Malleus Maleficarum, or the Hammer of Witches, which uh, now becomes the orthodox, the ultra-orthodox text that says that witches are to be hunt, hunted down and killed. And there's some really interesting details in that book. Um, for example, female witches uh, were said to cut off men's penises while they were sleeping and collect them in boxes and keep them in little boxes. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, you can, you can uh, come to your own conclusions about how these men 
felt about their own potency, shall we say. Um, okay, so 1489, Ulrich Molitor advocates execution of heretics and witches, but also argues that witches' sabbaths are a satanic illusion with no basis in reality. So because of that, he's considered a moderate. And he also said that the evidence obtained by torture is probably unreliable. And um, that, that was a big surprise to everybody. Wow, what a concept, you know. Um, then in the early to mid 1500s, witch hysteria, mass executions take place in both Catholic and Protestant areas of Switzerland, Italy, Germany, England, Ireland, France. Torture and testimony of children was used to entrap witches. And under torture, one witch would name another witch. And the panic spread. At that point, about 80,000 people were executed. 80% were women. Um, do we have any questions? There's seven comments in the chat. No? <laughs> Not yet. I did ask folks. Um, okay. I, I realized All I was right. just, I was just chatting good. with you, so I put it out to the, the larger Nobody's crowd, mad at me the, yet? Okay. Not yet. Not yet. So, <laughs> um, <clears throat> in 1531 in Germany, so if, you know, if anybody's interested in these different countries, you know, Germany had its own witch hysteria, Italy had one, you know, all these different countries you can look into. <clears throat> anyway, in Germany, a witch was charged with burning the town of Schiltach. And because of that, a witch hunt spread out from there to northern Italy, Switzerland, and all over Germany. In 1536, uh, the Danish witch burning picked up, really got going. In 1542, the English Witchcraft Act establishes official penalties for witchcraft. Also, the Italian Roman Inquisition. This is kind of interesting. The, some of the popes tried to, the, the Catholic Church did try to temper some of what was going on. In 1542, um, the Italian Roman Inquisition tried to keep the secular courts from torturing so much and killing so many people. Um, and uh, Ellen, we do actually have a comment oh, okay. um, from Stephanie Furlong. Uh, she's commenting that she sees so many parallels in this history with our current events. Exactly. And you'll see more as I go on. <laughs> Things, yes, we're still dealing with this, okay? Um, okay, so the Catholic, the Roman Catholic Manual for the Hunting of Witches uh, now urges caution. And they say that the goal is for witches to renounce their sins and be reconciled back into the Catholic Church, not so much to just torture and kill them. And again, that was a new idea. Um, so 1561 to 1670, uh, the worst witch hunts in Europe peak in central and southern Germany. In 1562, the Elizabethan Witchcraft Act is passed during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I. In 1577, Protestants begin to associate witchcraft with wild orgies, lewd, naked dancing, cannibalism, and infanticide. Uh, and witchcraft is viewed as a heresy that violates the commandment, thou shalt, thou shalt have no other god before me. Um, that also was a problem for the Hebrew high temple patriarchal monotheists when they were confronting the Canaanites, you know, because they had plenty of gods and goddesses. Uh, okay, 1581 to 93, the witch persecutions in Trier, Germany are at their height. 1590 to 91, the North, North Berwick witch trials are held in Scotland. And anybody Scottish, they're, they're about to erect, or they're erecting right now, a Scottish uh, monument to all the witches that were killed. And they've apologized. Uh, but King James VI of Scotland was terrified of witches. He had become engaged to Princess Anne of Denmark. And on the way to the wedding, um, the boat encountered a very bad storm. And Anne was forced to take refuge in Norway. 
uh, James goes to Norway to meet up with her and they marry, but on the way back to Scotland, there's another terrible storm. Um, six Danish women confess to having raised the storms. And you wonder, you know, what kind of torture they were under. Uh, James is now absolutely terrified of witches and he begins torturing and burning suspects. Um, he creates a royal commission to hunt down witches in Scotland. In 1597, um, King James publishes Demonology, a dissertation on necromancy, demonology, black magic, divination, and all the reasons witches should be persecuted under canonical law. And this book is a major inspiration for Macbeth by William Shakespeare. In, um, 1600 to 1692, which persecutions and trials happened in Norway? 1603 to 1606, uh, which trials happened in Fulda, Germany? 1606, Shakespeare writes Macbeth. And um, in Act 4, Scene 1, witches are depicted as strange old hags gathered around a cauldron chanting a rhymed spell, double, double, toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. Um, in 1609 to 1611, the witch trials peak in the Basque area, that's northern Spain and southern, southern France in the Pyrenees. In 1612, the English Pendle witch trials take place where three generations of a single family are driven through the streets of Lancaster to be hung by order of King James. And that includes children. Um, in 1613, the last witch execution in Holland takes place. The Dutch are always more tolerant and evolved somehow. Um, in 1626 to 1631, there are witch trials in Würzburg and Bamberg, Germany. 1635, the Roman Inquisition admits that it had found, quote, scarcely one trial conducted legally. Do we have a question? I was trying to clarify, actually. Um, oh, Deborah just put up. Um, Deborah, maybe if you want to change it so it goes to all in the all attendees and panelists, a um, a link to the Witch Museum in England, which uh, she had seen in on a PBS television show. Okay, so um, in sixteen in the sixteen forties, um, intense witch hunting continues in France and England. And then things gradually start to calm down in those areas. Um, in 1647, Matthew Hopkins, who is an Englishman, he is a failed lawyer. He calls himself the Witch Finder General, writes a book called The Discovery of Witches. And then he and his posse, his accomplices, kill nearly 300 suspected witches using forced confessions, examination for, of witches' marks, for example, warts, moles, insect bites. If you had any of those, they could say you were a witch because that was where the devil had uh, sucked on you. Um, and also the swimming tests where the accused witch would have her thumbs bound to her opposite big toes. She was thrown in a river. If she sank or drowned, she was innocent. If she floated, she was guilty. And then they would kill her. <laughs> so That's pretty gruesome. A real charmer. Um, he also pricked the skin of his victims with a jabbering needle to see if they were sens insensitive to pain. It was a retractable needle that guaranteed that the witch felt nothing, leading inevitably to her or his death. That book was brought to America and began the witch persecutions here. So Matthew Hopkins uh, is important for our country. Uh, 1648, Holland declares an end to all punishment for witchcraft. Um, 1650, um, in Rotenburg, Germany, they begin treating witchcraft cases, cases with caution. Uh, 1674, witch trials in Scandinavia are peaking. In Torsaker, Sweden, 71 witches are executed in one day. 
1675 to 1690, 139 people are executed in, for witchcraft in Salzburg, Austria. That's where I was born, by the way. <laughs> anyway, um, 1682, some of the last gasps of the English witch panic occur when Temperance Lloyd, a senile elderly woman, and Susanna Edwards are executed for witchcraft in Exeter. The overall numbers of those killed are lower in England than other countries, and only four witches were killed in Ireland. And the reason is that they had stronger laws and more centralized laws. Um, so if you have every little community coming up with its own laws, the chances of violence are much greater. If you have a stronger centralized legal system, um, then things go a little better. Um, now the idea that witches uh, really don't harm things that much and seeking confession through torture is cruel and inhumane, that idea begins to spread around Europe. 1693, the last witch execution in Denmark happens. 1715, Kate Nevin is hunted for three weeks in Scotland and then burned in Perthshire. Uh, 1716, Mary Hicks and her nine-year-old daughter Elizabeth are condemned to death and hanged in Huntington, England, accused of taking off their stockings in order to raise a storm. Um, 1727, elderly and senile Janet Horn is executed in Dornoch, Scotland, and was the last person executed for witchcraft in Scotland. 1735, the English Witchcraft Act uh, changes prosecutions from witchcraft to fraud, and um, now the idea of Satan being in control of everything diminishes, and fortune tellers and mediums become the new target. In 1750, Maria Theresa of Austria outlaws witch burning and torture. 1756, 15 year old Veronica Zerichin is beheaded and burned in Landshut, Germany, the last witch executed in that country. 1775, the last witch is executed in France. 1782, the last in Switzerland. 1793, the last in Poland. 1811, the last witch executed in Prussia. 1863, an accused male witch is drowned in a pond in Essex, England. 1895, Bridget Cleary of Ireland is beaten and then burned to death um, by her husband uh, because he, not so much for being a witch, he thinks that she's uh, a changeling, that she was uh, re replaced by the fairies, that it's not really his wife. So he kills her. <laughs> uh, he was accused of murder. Um, okay. So Ellen, so, there, there is one comment. Um, okay. Well, a few comments, actually. But yep. one in particular about uh, the fact that a bad rye crop might have caused the Salem witch trials. I don't know if that's something that's, you yeah, want to speak air to. Ergot poisoning is, a, is one of the theories. Um, the idea was that uh, the, the colony, the Salem colony, uh, for example, they didn't know how to grow crops in New England. It was very difficult. The growing period here is very short compared to England. So they were relying on um, grain coming in from England. And it took, I guess, six weeks for a ship to get here. And during that time, if there was rain or storms and the ship was getting wet, and then the grain would get wet, and then it would get moldy. And then, um, so there was ergot which is a type of fungus on the grain. And then they sold the grain to the colonists and the colonists ate it. That's one theory, you know? So they, they think that maybe that's why the little girls were hallucinating, for example, um, because they had ergot poisoning. It's possible. Um, anyway, the first person um, killed in New England was 1649. Oh, I'm sorry, that's the first persecution in New England was 1649. Mary Lewis Parsons, um, and um, she was actually in um, Massachusetts here. 
Um, but the first person executed was Alsie Young, and she was hanged in Hartford on May 26, 1647. And I, the way the book is, um, this, the way this book is organized, it, it starts out with, with the ancient history with more details than what I just gave you. Then I talked to descendants, and I didn't know when I started this. I thought, you know, to find a descendant of a New England witch would be like a really big deal, but there are thousands of them. They're everywhere. <laughs> so um, what I have is I have interviews with descendants of New England witches, and these are accused witches. They're not real witches. They're actually Christian women who are accused of being witches. Um, and then I have the stories of the witches, uh, what, ha what happened to them, why they were accused, and so on. So the first one was hanged in Hartford, Connecticut, which is not far from us, right? May 26, 1647. This is long before Salem. And this is something I don't think a lot of people appreciate. Salem was the end. It's where it stopped. And it didn't even happen in Salem. It happened in Danvers. So, so it's all kind of a big show. But anyway, um, so... In 1945, an elderly farmhand was executed in Warwickshire, England, accused of being a wizard. In 1951, the English Witchcraft Act is finally repealed, and it had been in force until the 1940s. And again, as I mentioned, it was mainly used to persecute spiritualists, gypsies, tarot card readers, people like that. But that was finally overturned in 1951, and that's when people could be public about witchcraft. In 1997, two Russian farmers killed a woman and injured her family members because they said she used folk magic against them. Um, <clears throat> okay. So... I don't want to go too much into Salem because you guys should go to Salem. You can go to Salem and you can get the history there. Um, and you can read about it in the book. Uh, so what I want to do now is I want to uh, talk about modern witches because the, the third, the last third of the book um, is all about modern witchcraft. Um, there are modern witches. And because the Witchcraft Act was overturned in 1951, um, and because after Salem, as I mentioned, um, I, people in Massachusetts were so ashamed of themselves, restitution was paid to the families, everybody apologized. Was, none of them were witches. The only one who could have been a witch was Tituba, and she was not killed. The only possible witch um, who apparently knew what she was doing. Okay, so what does the word witch mean? Um, the word witch, we don't really know, but it could come from the word wick, which means a green shoot from a healthy young plant, so something new coming up, or wicker. Wicker is willow that is bent while it's still green, and witches can bend reality and shape reality to their will. Um, in the past, uh, which, well, I'm talking about modern witches now, okay. In, in the medieval times, uh, witches were, well, they had, they probably had covens, but they were usually solitary and they were uh, cunning men, wise women, which meant they were herbalists, they were midwives. When the uh, male doctors started coming in, uh, they were in competition with the midwives, so um, they wanted to get rid of them, and they started accusing the midwives of being witches, and the herbalists of being witches. Uh, it, was a, it was a way of getting rid of people. Um, but uh, in the Middle Ages, you had the, the upper classes had doctors, and the lower classes, the village people, had the cunning man or the wise woman who was a veterinarian. They knew how to heal animals. Um, they were an herbalist, they healed people, they were a counselor. If you were having problems, you could come to them and they might give you a little charm or something. Um, and so there were these kinds of people and they were a threat to the church because the church wanted to tell you that 
if you had a problem, you should give money to the priest or say 10 Hail Marys or whatever. Don't, you don't go to that old woman down the road, you know. Um, so modern witches um, used to be strictly trained in covens, but now modern witches can go to Amazon or Barnes and Noble and or their local independent bookstore, they can read one book and say, hey, I'm a witch, you know. Um, so in the past, before the internet and all that, usually um, witchcraft was passed down from teacher to student. So you had one way of doing things. You were in a tradition. Now most people are eclectic and solitary. So this is very different. Um, and uh, nobody, nobody can say anything about it. You know, you're, you, if you call yourself a witch and you're solitary and self-trained, nobody can say anything. <laughs> um, so um, in the Middle Ages, part of the fear of witches, and it still persists to this day. I mean, people are still afraid of witches, but the witch was a law unto him or herself. That meant that you didn't know who they sided with. If you go back 2,000 years ago in um, Celtic areas, for example, you had the Druids. The Druids were highly educated. They were part of the nobility. And they worked with the uh, rulers, with the kings and queens. And everybody knew where the Druids stood. The Druid was working on behalf of the king or the queen. They were called the two kidneys of the kingdom. The king couldn't operate without a druid at their side. The druid knew all the laws and precedents. They were lawyers. They were judges. Um, they were highly trained intellectuals. That's what they were. But again, the, the common poor people had their wizards and, and cunning men and, and women who helped them. But um, the druid was always working on the side of the the kingdom and the rulers and everybody knew that that's what they did but the witch who was probably solitary living away from the village somewhere um, was a terrifying person because you didn't know whose side they were on you know um, they were a law unto themselves and they were also their own priest and priestess and that was upsetting to the church because they wanted everybody to be under their purview. Um, and the witch was saying, hey, I can contact the divine on my own. I have my own relationship with Diana or, you know, whatever divinity they were working with. Um, and that was unacceptable, which uh, got them in trouble. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so today we have popular media. We have TV shows like The Witch, Charmed, uh, you can go to uh, book signing, or hey, you might hear talk about witchcraft uh, over the internet on Facebook. Um, you know, you can take classes at a bookstore. It's all over the place now. I mean, even I'm old enough that, you know, when I was being trained as a druid, when I started out, there was no internet. I mean, that's how far, far back I go. And it was really hard to get the information and to find someone who could train you. Now it's everywhere. All you have to do is Google it. Um, one of the interesting things I figured out as I was doing the research for the book and interviewing modern witches, and the same thing happened when I have a book called The Legacy of Druids, where I did the, the same thing with Druids. Most of them are Catholic or ex-Catholics, um, which is fascinating to me. And I think it's because the Catholic religion, I still have a certain affection for the Catholic religion because the Catholic religion kept Mary, who is the goddess, you know, in thinly disguised. And uh, she's not emasculated. What's the word? She's, <laughs> she, she, her powers have been taken away. Um, but, it, but it's the goddess, you know, they kept the goddess. And so people who wanted to have a feminine side of deity, I mean, even in Judaism, there's a feminine side of deity, the Shekinah. Um, but when you get the Protestant religion, they wiped out the feminine. And so um, people 
you know, people look at the Protestant religion, they feel like something's missing. Half of it is missing. But uh, ex-Catholics make excellent pagans. They make excellent witches. Um, they, they have the robes, the candles, the incense, the feminine deity. Um, so that's, that's what I saw. Um, okay, so what is witchcraft today? Some say it's an art. Some say it's a science. Some say it's a religion. Some say it's all of those things. So what is the art? The art is the spells and psychic practices. What is the science? It's the study of nature. What is the religion? It's the honoring of deities and holy days and clergy. You have all of that. That makes it a religion. You have belief in higher powers. Um, you have a system of beliefs and philosophies. You have a hierarchy of religious practitioners. If you're training in a traditional way, um, you could be self-trained also. Um, but usually if you're, if you're studying a tradition, you're going to have holy relics. You're going to have ritual attire. You're going to have neophytes and then initiates and then high priests, high priestesses, which queens, which elders, specific lineage groups. Um, and that's a religion. And it has a philosophy and you're expected to understand the philosophy. Um, one person explained it as witchcraft is the interface between the mundane world and the world of spirit and magic exploring the hidden and veiled powers. So it's about delving into the hidden, delving into the dark. Yes, some are pagan, some are not. <laughs> um, you know, uh, the strega, for example, are tra traditional Italian witches. And um, you could go into a, a cathedral in Italy and see these little old ladies all dressed in black, lighting candles in front of the Statue of Mary. But what they're actually doing, they have their candle and they inscribe Diana on it or a petition of some kind, which in their mind, they're actually worshiping Diana. But they go into the church and they're wearing the horns, you know, and <laughs> they light the candle to Diana in the Catholic church. Um, and so they might be very good Catholics. They might be baptized. Uh, they went through you know, confirmation, and they go, they go to mass, and they're witches, the strega. Um, so you can be pagan or not pagan. And probably throughout the Middle Ages, throughout history, most witches were probably trying to be Christians, because that's how you avoided getting in trouble, you know. So I have a question, actually, yep. based on what you just said. Mm -hmm. um, and I was listening to your history, but I'm not sure if I caught it all through the older history. Was there a lot of witch persecution in Southern Europe where Catholicism stayed the strong religion? Yeah, there was. There was. But, but what I thought was interesting, because in my mind, I always thought that the, the Pope and the church were the big enemy. But it was kind of surprising to me that at one point, the Pope intervenes and says, hey, you know, um, we're more interested in saving their soul than torturing and killing them. Um, yeah, you had the Spanish Inquisition went, went on merrily, killing people, you know. Uh, yeah. Um, okay, so witches, what do they do? They harness high emotions and natural events to cause a particular outcome. So a, a very simple example. Right now, we're at a time of year where the leaves are falling, right? They're just starting to fall. So if you needed to let go of something, if you were really upset with somebody or in a situation that you needed to let go of, you can use the energy of the falling leaves. You can stand there and you can allow the falling leaves to help you, to work with you. I mean, that, that's really the ultimate goal is to be the witch. To, it's a way of being. You know, so you could step outside and just be, or you could stand in front of a, a, a stream that's moving and, and allow the water to take your, your problems away, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and the more emotion that you have, the way a spell really works is if you have a very strong intention and you have emotion behind it. 
if you're just sort of blandly reciting, you know, some rhyming words with no feeling, it's not going to do anything. But if you can work in harmony with nature, uh, that's going to really amplify what you're doing. That's what witches do. <clears throat> okay. Um, I got so much stuff here. There's, you know, I could go on, I could do a whole weekend. <laughs> but anyway, um, the philosophy of what is the philosophy of witches? Are you living your personal truth? So you have to identify your personal truth. Are you living it? Are you challenging yourself to remain open to other ways of being in the world? Are you taking responsibility for your participation in the creation of the world? Are you being compassionate with yourself and others? Being a witch is what you are. It's not what you believe. It's what you are. It's a way of being. Okay. And then the craft comes in um, making potions, talismans, medicines, charms, candles, wands, staffs. And, and I should mention, um, I, I sort of have to do this, sorry. <laughs> it's almost Halloween. But um, the sacred herbs of Samhain. And then I have um, another one, the sacred herbs of spring. But if you want to learn how to make uh, different potions and charms and herbal uh, magic and stuff like that, um, yeah, you can see all my books at my website. But um, okay, and then uh, having a close relationship with the elements, earth, air, fire, water, spirit. That's the pentagram, right? Um, a strong connection to the ancestors, a strong connection to the land and to the moon, the phases of the moon, and working with and using the phases of the moon. Uh, if you really are a witch, it permeates everything, your home, your artwork, the work you do in the world. Um, and uh, there's different kinds of witchcraft, which you can read the book to get into. For example, in Puerto Rico, they have brujeria or espiritismo, which is passed down strictly through families. It's rare to find an American um, fam tread. Uh, people claim it, but it's rare to find it. Although now, because paganism in the United States has been public for 30 or 40 years now, there are young kids that were actually trained as witches and raised as witches. But um, if somebody tells you that their grandmother, great grandmother was a witch, usually you have to take it with a grain of salt. Uh, okay. So what do witches do? Um, study, worship, heal, do magic, celebrate the seasons, celebrate the festivals, the moons, connect with the dead and the ancestors, consecrate people, places, and things. Um, witches, modern witches are functioning as sort of like medicine people in indigenous societies. They serve the spirits, they serve the gods, and they serve the people of their community. This is somebody who's really doing it. You have a lot of people who go to Barnes and Noble and pick up a book and they say, gee, I'm a witch, you know. But if you're really doing it, you're, you have an altar, at least one altar. I have three, okay? But you have to have, you have in the house, out in the yard, you know, you have altars. You, you make offerings to the spirits. You commune with the gods. You have a relationship with the gods or a particular god or goddess. And you're there for the people of your community. If they get sick, if they need something. Um, okay. All right, I can't get into everything. There's just too much. Okay, so who or what do witches worship? Generally, the old medicine men, why were they not thought to be witches? Um, when, the, when the English um, colonists came to America initially, uh, they decided that witch, well, at that point, they thought witches were female. So if they found a medicine woman, they thought it was a witch. And that, that person might have been a person of power. They might even have been um, 
the ruler of a particular tribe. They, you know, they might have been the chief, but the English men couldn't see that. So um, they would decide they were a witch, and that was bad news. Okay, um, so who or what do witch, witches worship? The pre-Christian deities. And th this is... Um, this is kind of why I, I came to the conclusion myself that that whole horrible 1,000 plus year episode of witch persecution um, was really about the Christian church being in competition with the old gods and goddesses. And our, you know, people say, oh, as soon as I encountered paganism or as soon as I encountered witchcraft or as soon as I encountered druidism, I, I felt right at home immediately. Why is that? It's because we, for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, I'm, th I'm talking about Western Europe here. And, you know, we, we were forest people. Um, we lived in a green, watery place. Uh, we were thankful to the earth because it gave us beautiful water and we had beautiful trees and everything was lush and we got our animals and our food from the forest and it wasn't a nasty place, it was where we lived. And, we got our medicine from the forest and we, you know, we were forest dwellers. And there used to be an unbroken oak forest that went from the west coast of France all the way to the Black Sea. It was nothing but oak forest. And we got everything from that. We got the acorns for food and then the animals that ate the acorns for food. And you know, that's, that's the religion that we had. And we gave thanks to the trees and to the water and to, you know, and then along comes this Middle Eastern desert religion which is a religion of scarcity, uh, you know, where, oh, everything's terrible and you should feel bad. And, you know, that all comes in. And um, so for a thousand years, there was this big struggle, you know. So witches, druids, pagans, what are they doing? They're going back to the pre-Christian deities that, that we had for thousands of years. Um, some are just in relationship with nature. They don't have deities, they just worship the elements or nature. Um, witchcraft is a little different than Druidism. Witchcraft is duotheistic. It usually, usually recognizes a goddess and a god, and they'll say all the goddesses are one goddess, all the gods are one god. Um, Druids are polytheistic, so we see individual deities as separate. We don't conflate them all. Um, Southern Europeans have a solar god and a lunar goddess. Uh, Northern Europe, the sun is female, and that's in Scandinavia, Sunna, and also among the Celts. The sun is female, and the moon is her sister. So this is a druidic mystery, but the sun is female, the moon is female, the earth is female, all the rivers are female. <laughs> But that's a whole other subject. It's all female, which is terrifying to men sometimes. Um, but uh, witches can be eclectic. They can pick and choose from different pantheons, or they can specialize and just be Egyptian, you know, have Egyptian deities, or just Roman deities, or just Celtic deities, or just Greek deities, or Norse deities. Um, usually, they're, they're more eclectic than druids, I would say. Um, and then the purpose of worshiping the deity is not to grovel in front of the deity and say, gee, I'm so bad and you're so good and I, and I, and I have no power and you have all the power. That's not what it is. It's having a relationship, a direct one-on-one -on -one relationship with the deity, with the goal of being more like the deity. <laughs> So, for example, Lu, master of every art, you know, if you need to master a trade um, or a craft, you could uh, make offerings to Lu, um, meditate on Lu, have a nice altar for Lu, and gee, Lu, I want to be just like you, you know, that's, that's kind of how it goes. Um, and then um, the purpose of ritual. The purpose of ritual, there are regular 
seasonal rituals to honor nature, to honor the ancestors, to honor the fairies, to honor the deities. But ultimately, high magic is you're supposed to transform yourself. So um, every ritual should have an aspect of uh, self transformation buried in it somewhere. Um, the emphasis is more on the female aspect of divinity. It's probably the only religion in the world now that does that, um, that has female clergy. There's a great book uh, called The Triumph of the Moon by Ronald Hutton, which I urge everyone to read. And it goes into Gerald Gardner's history and um, all the different, he had six different versions of his Book of Shadows and it started out with the priest being the most important thing and the male priest which was clothed and surrounded by naked women dancing around him that's how it started and by the time he finished um it was uh, the priestess was the most important uh clergy person and so that's worth uh looking at um some people see the gods and goddesses as actual personalities. Some see them as archetypes. And there's no required belief system. Um, but it's not really about belief so much as it is about direct experience. That's what you're looking for, direct experience. Like you don't have to believe in a rock. You can have the experience of a rock. You don't have to believe in a waterfall. You have the experience of a waterfall. Um, any questions? I see 18 items in chat. No? Okay. No, um, no new questions. And, and just so you know, you asked me to give you a time check. It's, uh, it's about 8.15. Oh, my goodness. What, <laughs> we're in, we're, <laughs> I have so... We should really do a weekend workshop yeah. <laughs> because there's just... This is just a huge subject. Um, so I have a question, actually. Yeah. I, and I think I know the answer from what you've said so far. But so are folks like, you know, Lady Gaga says born that way? Or do people just decide that they want to be a witch? I'm just curious to know your thoughts on that. Yes. <laughs> like I said, some people read a book. They read one book. And they go, gee, I'm a witch, you know. And, I and that does that count as being a witch? If you nobody can, can tell you. Oh, there, okay. there's no pope. Nobody can tell you that you're not a witch. But people who are trained, <laughs> there's a big difference between going through formal Gardnerian witchcraft training and somebody who picked up a book at the Barnes and Noble. There's a huge difference. Okay. But nobody can tell you that if you think you're a witch, or if you think you're a druid, if you're in your soul, your soul is telling you that that's what you are. There's nobody, there's no pagan pope. There's nobody who can say, no, you're a heretic. You know, you can't, we can't do that. But, you know, ooh, there's a question. Hello. Oh, okay. I'm going to turn on uh, John's speaker so he can ask his question. Can you just read it? Is there a question? He's going to uh, say it himself, I believe. Oh, okay. Hey, folks, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, we can. Hello? Oh, Hello? the Andy speaker doesn't work. Oh, we can hear you. Is that John? Can you hear us? We can hear you. Oh, we did. I have to say, I learned from my grandmother who learned from her mother. John? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe John needs to type his question. Whoop. John, can you type your question? All right, while he's doing that, <laughs> um, I'm I just wanted to talk about uh, what a basic rich stop hearing anything. We hear you. We hear you. Well, I'll mute him for the meantime till he fixes his technology. We can hear you, John, even though you can't hear us. His microphone is turned off right now. 
I turned it off because it sounded like he was having more difficulty. Oh, okay. a list of landmarks in New England that are essential to visit. You mean regarding witchcraft? <laughs> um, well, what I would, okay. Um, other than Salem, go to Danvers because that's where the actual Salem uh, executions happened, not in Salem. And uh, there's actually a new monument. It only went up a few years ago in Danvers. And you can go there. That's the real deal. So why did Salem, you know, why is Salem known as the capital of witch persecution if that's not really the capital? Because Lori Cabot and other shopkeepers popularized it. They did a really good job. <laughs> Um, you know, it, it's a big commercial enterprise, um, tourist area, lots of shops, but, but, you know, you shouldn't sneeze at that, or I shouldn't sneeze at that because, um, which shops are often the portal for people to find teachers and books and, and learn, you know, although nowadays you can Google, Google is everything. <laughs> but, um, Anyway, um, oh, did you find the consumption hysteria with, me? like I said, there, there are over 300 cases in New England of persecuted witches. And that's not one of the ones that I pursued. The, the only ones that I outline in the book are the ones where I found their descendant and the descendant was willing to talk to me. So I interview the descendant and then I put the story. And then there's an essay in here also by Peter Muiz from Maine. Is that his name? I think so. Anyway, he taught, he mentions various witches. I tried to cover every, I, I have something from every state, um, but I don't remember. That one doesn't ring a bell. There's over 300 of them, you know, and, and I don't claim to, um, have exhaustively studied all 300 cases. I just didn't. Because I, I was interested in the whole scope from 1400 BC to today. Yeah. There you go, list of people executed for witchcraft. Very good. Okay, um, so what's a basic ritual look like? Um, witches cast circles, druids don't. Um, folk Traditional folk uh, practitioners, you know, in the Middle Ages, the cunning men, uh, the wise women, they wouldn't have cast circles. That comes from high ceremonial magic from um, the Elizabethan, Elizabethan era, very educated magicians, you know, court magicians. Queen Elizabeth had one. Um, the reason witches cast a circle they call in the four directions. You cast a circle to hold the energy so that you can raise, contain the energy in an in a enclosed cauldron, raise the energy, and send it out, okay, basically. Um, folk practitioners, druids, don't do that. Um, we do not cast a circle because we don't wall off anything. We, we work directly with nature, with the nature spirits, with the ancestors who, and the fairies who are under the ground. Um, with the animal spirits, with the trees, with the herbs, everything. We want everybody, all the energies to move in and out. That's, it's a different philosophy. But anyway, um, um, then the witch, okay, you cast the circle, you call the quarters, north, east, south, west, call in your god, goddess, or god and goddess, ancestors, fairies, other powers. Do something symbolic of the season and um, for example, honor the sun at the solstices, putting out food for the ancestors at Halloween, lighting a candle in the snow at Imbolc uh, to kindle the fires of spring, so on. Then you do a divination. Uh, oh, John would like to try again with his question, so we will go ahead and unmute. All right, John, you're live. Can you hear me, I hope? Yes. yes. Oh, good heavens, it works. Yay. That, thank you so much. Thank you for, um, for this. It's all, uh, it's all very interesting. A, uh, a quick observation is that I'm hearing an extraordinary amount of similarity 
between um, Christians, and if I may use the um, phrase loosely, uh, witches. And um, anybody can say they're a Christian, just like anybody can say they're a uh, witch, I gather from this. But let's talk about the practicing ones. And it sounds like that the goal is to transform yourself into mm -hmm. a better individual. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the attraction for um, people who had been in Roman Catholicism is it is from a religious perspective studies um, uh, an extraordinary ritualistic church and if you learn to love ritual and there's really is quite beautiful among the many beautiful um, religious rituals in the world then this has attraction my question is we're hearing a lot of men women men are witches, then later women are witches, and female leaders, male leaders and stuff. With our new understanding of gender, um, where will that leave things in the future? Does it really matter in that regard when we think about it? Well, that's I'll what everybody- my answer offline, viewers, thank you. Yeah, that's what everybody's struggling with now. That's, that's what's happening right now. Um, and it's a, it's a problem because, you know, traditional Gardnerian witchcraft, you know, you have the goddess and the god. Um, and then again, because anybody can do whatever they want, <laughs> some man could, could draw down the goddess. He could personify the goddess or some woman could personify the god. If that's what they chose, if that's what they wanted to do. Things are very fluid these days, <laughs> you know. Um, does that answer the question? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it used to be a real problem um, because, you know, May Day is all about fertility, for example, and Beltane. And you dance the maypole and then you're supposed to go out and male and female and, you know, have sex out in the fields and fertilize the, the crops and all that. But um, so what do you do if you have a coven that's all women or a coven that's all men? What do you do then? You know, uh, you have to get very creative. Uh, okay, so let's see. Uh, there's just so much. If, if, if anybody else has a question and dual natured theology applies, what, is, what does that mean? What does that mean? I don't know. I don't know what dual natured theolo theology means. Oh, male, male and female. Yeah, duotheism. But that that's duotheism assumes that you have a male principle and a female principle. What if your coven is all men? Or what if your coven is all women? Oh, together in one body. Okay intersex <laughs> it's so complicated <laughs> okay spells i thought this was fun <laughs> um so witches really do spells and um you know i asked every single witch that i interviewed um you know do you do spells and everybody said yes and i said well can you give an example and they said oh no i can't do that and i said well just give us some nice you know, non-threatening examples. Okay, so here's some examples. Um, finding lost objects by making an offering to the fairies. You lose your car keys, you make an offering to the fairies, the car keys appear. Um, raising energy under the full moon, raising a cone of power, sending it out to achieve a goal. Raising energy under the new moon to set a new plan into motion. Um, having a complex spell with candles of a specific color, incense of a specific type, specific herbs at a specific time of day. Or a spell can be very simple, uh, using a pendulum, yes or no, for something. Um, a spell to protect animals, to enhance the fertility of the garden, for safe travel, for protecting the car. There are specific herbs that you can use for that, for example, and stones probably. Um, a spell uh, should raise energy, focus the intent, and link it to a recipient. But spells are considered low magic, okay? 
high magic is self-transformation. I have read herbs garden can emit powers. Yes, <laughs> there are specific herbs uh, that you can use. Um, you can carry garlic in your pocket, for example, as a form of protection or an acorn to enhance your projects. This is a good time to gather acorns, by the way. I always have acorns in my coat pockets because that's all about uh, fertility and not necessarily babies, but, you know, fertility of projects. Um, some people are very good at visualizing parking spaces. Uh, candle spells, which are used for power and courage, yellow for the sun, anointed with frankincense oil, burning frankincense, copal, and benzoin. Those are all solar herbs, which give you courage. Um, a spell can be, a pr it's like a prayer, or it could also be a curse. Um, the waxing moon, waxing moon magic is used to gain things. Waning moon magic is to banish and dismiss things. So that's working with nature. You can do, you could banish things at any time, but if you're working during the waning moon, your intention is going to be more empowered, you know. Uh, a spell to disperse bad energies from a house. Place half an onion in a bowl of vinegar, add a few teaspoons of salt, leave it overnight, and then dispose of it away from the house. It absorbs the bad energies. Even just lighting a candle with intention. Uh, Christians do that all the time. They light candles, right? Um, a Christian prayer is very similar to a spell. If you have an intention, oh, I need this. Jesus, please give me this, and you light a candle. Same thing, it's a spell. Um, you might pick a favorable day astrologically uh, or a, a favorable hour or a favorable day of the week. So you have to learn the hours, you know. Um, you can work with spirits, jinns, elementals, gods, goddesses. You can work for lofty ends, like changing the civilization that you happen to have been born in or <laughs> banal needs, uh, you know, I need a raise at work because I can't pay the rent. Um, so high magic, as I, as I mentioned, is a spiritual change and growth in the practitioner. That's high magic. And not everybody does high magic. It's rare. You know, if, if you can find people that do that, it's special. Grab them, you know. Anyway, um, it's 8.30. I, I, there's just so much here. Like I said, I could do a whole weekend um, just on this. But is, are there any last questions, complaints, problems before we go? Look at my website, ellenevernhotman.com. I have a lot of books. I, counting the ones that are not out yet, I think I have 16 books right now. Thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> yeah, just ellenevernhotman.com and uh, you can see all my stuff. And you can also send me a, a letter if you want, a message. And I'm on Facebook and I'm on Twitter. Um, Facebook is a really good place to contact me or go to my website. And if you're interested in Druidism, you can go to tribeoftheoak.com. And uh, we study, we're, we're very scholarly. We, you know, we like the, the real old stuff, the, you know, going back to the sixth century. So. Well, thank you, Ellen. That was uh, amazing. And I'm sure there's plenty more that we could learn from you. So, uh, well, you and I will stay in touch. And if uh, folks are asking for more, maybe we can set up another program with you in the future. I appreciate you uh, doing this for us online when we first started this conversation many months ago. It was going to be a live and in-person event, and yeah. um, I'm happy that we were able to still bring you to our Attleboro community uh, online. So thank goodness for technology. Some people might call that witchcraft, right? No. It's a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> Floating heads, just speaking randomly. 
So thank you again. If there's no more questions, uh, we're going to end this evening's uh, presentation. But thank you, and uh, we hope to see you at uh, more of our Big Read events. And reach out to me if you're interested in us uh, bringing Ellen back to the community. Um, all of you should have my email address since I sent you the link to this program tonight. So thank you again. Thank you, Ellen. And uh, have a good evening, all. Bye. <laughs>